We started going through this chapter two weeks ago, but we did not get through all of it. And for the sake of reminding you what our outline was and is, we examined, first of all, the Song of the Sealed. And under that, we looked at the source of the singing, the specification of the singers, and the substance of the song. And that was all about the 144,000 witnesses. These are the same 144,000 that we saw back in chapter 7 that were sealed by God and promised supernatural protection. Here they are singing a new song of salvation, and although they begin with Christ on Mount Zion at His second coming, they will ultimately sing this song around the throne of God. Then we saw the announcement of the angels. In this section, verses 6 through 13, there are four important announcements. First of all, there is the proclamation of the deadline. That's verses 6 and 7. In light of the hour of God's judgment being imminent, God will commission an angel to proclaim the eternal gospel. The eternal gospel, as we saw, is the very same gospel that has been proclaimed throughout the church age. But this is the first time that we see an angel proclaiming it. The phrase, loud voice, implies that it's going to be proclaimed loudly enough for everyone in the world to hear it, but it also implies the urgency with which it is conveyed. This is ultimately their last chance to repent before the bowls of wrath, judgment begin to come. And here, the emphasis will be that the one who has created all things has the right to expect worship from his creation. And he has the right to judge those whom he has created. The creator is also the judge. He is the one that people should fear and worship rather than Satan and Antichrist. Secondly, we saw the pronouncement of doom. In verse 8, we see another angel who is going to proclaim the fall of Babylon. And unlike the first one, this angel is not going to be proclaiming good news, the good news of the gospel, but the bad news of God's judgment. This is an indication that the people will not heed the message of the first angel. But look at verse 8 with me. And another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. This is the first reference to uh, Babylon in the Revelation, but we're going to see much more about Babylon in chapters 17 and 18. This is an anticipative announcement of what will also happen as the great tribulation nears its end. Babylon's fall will be connected with the outpouring of the seven bowls of wrath. And this final Babylon will be a harlot who will force all the nations to drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. The world will be intoxicated, deceived, and seduced by the Babylonian false religion headed by Antichrist. And having imbibed the wine of the seductive harlot, the nations of the world will continue on their course of spiritual defection from God and will end up drinking the wine of the wrath of God, as we see in verse 10. So we see irony in this. Now, we're going to see all the details of that when we get to chapter 16, verses 17 through 19, and in chapter 17 and 18. Now, all that is review, but here's where we left off last time. The next announcement given to John is the promise of damnation. Let's read verses 9 through 11 again. And another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, 
if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or upon his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, this passage is one of the most graphic pictures of hell in the entire Bible. Sweet says, this is the most horrible picture of eternal punishment in the entirety of the Revelation. And of course, the doctrine of hell is very unpopular today. Nobody really wants to talk about it. I certainly don't enjoy preaching about hell, but I have a divine mandate to do so. It is the undeniable truth of Scripture. In fact, our Lord Jesus spoke more about hell than anyone else. And we know that it is not the will of God for anyone to go there. He has done everything possible to keep us from hell. In Matthew 18, 14, we read, It is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish God doesn't want anyone to die and spend an eternity separated from God in hell. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God is patient. God is allowing more time for people to come to understand the gospel and repent. Now, some have said it's not fair for God to send people to hell. But is it fair for a person to die if they refuse a cure that is available to them? You remember the the account of the serpent in the wilderness? Remember uh, the poisonous Uh, snakes that came into the camp and they were biting the people and the people were dying. And so what did Moses do? He took a bronze serpent and he put it up in the middle of the camp. And what was the command? Look at the serpent and you will live. Look and live. But you know what? Those who didn't look, they died. And so is the message of the gospel. God says, you can live. You can have eternal life. You don't have to end up in hell forever. There's a solution. There's the the answer. The gospel, the cross is lifted up. Look and live. You don't have to die. Now, we could spend a lot of time on all the arguments against hell and all the reasons why people have trouble with this doctrine. But the bottom line is that the Bible clearly teaches it. And the only question for us really is, do we believe what God has said? And we could spend a lot of time talking about the philosophical and theological arguments of the reality of hell. But the simple truth is, that if you believe the Bible is the Word of God, then you must believe in the doctrine of hell because the Bible clearly declares it. In fact, I would go so far as to say that we sin against God if we fail to teach it in the church. Evangelist Junior Hill once said, There's no single element that would bring revival to our land greater than an an enlarged vision of eternal retribution. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, once said, it would be more valuable for every preacher to spend two weeks in hell than to attend every college and seminary in the world. We must teach it because the Bible teaches it. And these guys like Joel Osteen who never preach on hell or anything negative 
are going to have to give an account to God for failing to declare this truth. But notice who it is in this passage that is going to be in hell. Look at verse 9 again. And another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. The word for receives there means to voluntarily take. Listen, anyone who goes to hell ultimately chooses it. In that day, the choice will be clear. You will either receive the mark of the beast or die. But what the Bible declares is that all those who do receive the mark of the beast will spend eternity in hell. Now, in our day and time, it may seem as if the choice is not as clear, but it really is. It really is. You either choose Christ or you choose Satan. Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me. The author of Hebrews asks, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? And the truth of Scripture is, if you do not say yes to Christ, you have said no to him. You have rejected him. There is no middle grounds when it comes to the gospel. And remember, the destiny for those who reject Christ during the tribulation is the same as at any other time in history. Now, verses 10 and 11 describe what hell will be like. Look at it again. He also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. That is a graphic image. And yet, as frightening a picture that is painted there, it really doesn't do it justice. I remember hearing Junior Hill one time tell about a skinny little guy that came up to him one time. And, and by the way, Junior Hill is a, a really big guy. And, and this guy said, Brother Hill, you're one of those hellfire and damnation kind of preachers, aren't you? And he said, I remember thinking to myself, what other kind is there? But then he said, I don't like you evangelists. You're too emotional. You always try to scare people. And Junior Hill told this man, my friend, if you could spend one minute in hell, you would change your mind. You would have a totally different perspective. Now, I wish I could say that the Bible teaches that hell is a place where men will suffer for a little while and then be burned up, never to be remembered again. Or that uh, they would then be given another chance to enter into heaven. But I can't say that because the Bible declares that there will be no end to the torment of those in hell. Verse 12 says, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest, day or night. You say, but pastor, that's just symbolism. Well, you know, there are places in the Bible where the scripture does employ, the Bible writers employ symbolism. But do you know why the Bible sometimes uses symbols? God doesn't give us symbols to change the facts so that we can dismiss the truth of them, but he sometimes gives us symbols because the reality of the situation is greater than the symbol. So in order for us to grasp a little better understanding of it, he gives us a word picture, an illustration. And the point is, that if this is not literal, then it's worse. 
it's worse. The word picture doesn't do it justice. Listen, some people think that hell is not going to be much worse than going to the dentist. I mean, some people think they're going to just have a great time with all their buddies in hell. I promise you that is not the case. That is not the way the Bible describes it. And yet, many preachers will not even warn people about it. What a shame. Someone once said, for the life of me, I can't understand how a man can say he's called to preach and then stand and quote Shakespeare and recite poetry and talk about the theological implications of a grub worm while all the time failing to warn people of eternal punishment. Notice the phrase, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. The ones who drink the wine of the harlot will also have to drink the wine of the wrath of God. Steve Gregg explains that it was a common practice in all ancient Mediterranean societies to dilute wine with several parts of water before drinking it. But not in this case. The wrath of God for these people will be served up full strength, meaning there is no element of grace or hope or compassion blended with the judgment. It will be pure judgment. He says, verse 11 strongly affirms that those who reject God's mercy will experience an eternity of torment to regret it. John MacArthur writes, this angel would strongly disagree with those who deny the eternality of hell. He says it is consistent with the rest of Scripture. And though human sensitivities may balk at the doctrine of eternal punishment, it is both the explicit teaching of the Bible and demanded by God's justice and holiness. Mounts declares, no kind of semantic manipulation or recourse to symbolic language can erase the fact of eternal punishment conveyed in this announcement. Alan Johnson also points to C.S. Lewis, who acknowledges that hell is, in fact, a detestable doctrine that he would willingly remove from Christianity if it was within his power. But, as he goes on to point out, the question is not whether it is detestable, but whether it is true. Well, it's almost as if John now senses how heavy this is. And so he takes a moment to give his hearers a breather here. So in verses 12 through 13, we have the perfection of the dead. The perfection of the dead. The description of hell is so somber and so frightening, he has to stop and remind everyone of the blessedness of those who die in the Lord. Look with me at verses 12 and 13. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow with them. This is the second of seven Beatitudes found in the Revelation. And it is a general teaching of Scripture that all those who die in the Lord are blessed. Now, many people would not think of the dead as being blessed, but that is what the Word of God declares. Paul said in Philippians 1.21, For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. All of us who are in Christ can say that. Psalm 116.15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His godly ones. And that is true, of course, because death issues them into the presence 
of their Lord and their eternal reward. But while that is true of all believers of every age, there is a sense in which it is especially true of those tribulation saints who die in the face of the persecution of the beast. Verse 13 uses the phrase, from now on, to place special emphasis on the tribulation martyrs. Dr. Thomas says, relating the words to those facing persecution and death does not deny blessedness to all other saints when they die. It simply means that death for those who remain faithful in the face of more active persecution is greater relief. And one of the reasons why these saints will be especially blessed is because they are finally going to be able to rest from all their labors. This has particular application to the extreme difficulty of surviving under the rule of the Antichrist. MacArthur points out that the word kapas, laborers, describes hard, difficult, exhausting toil. It can also refer to bother, annoyance, or trouble. He says, certainly the tribulation saints will experience the whole gamut of this word's meanings. They will be filled with deep sorrow as they watch those they love, children, parents, spouses, friends, suffer torment and death. Their lives will be a hard, difficult, dangerous struggle for survival. And I like the way Dr. Thomas puts it. He says, here is the direct opposite of the beast worshipers who will have no rest day or night. To be sure, those opposing God will not endure the labors, kapan, or violent death because of a saintly life because they will comply with the beast's demands. But beyond the grave will be a totally different story. The saints will rest from their troubles and their harsh treatment, but at death, the troubles of the antagonists will begin and never end. So when death comes to them, these tribulation saints, it will be a relief in many ways. And the fact that their deeds follow with them indicates that they will then receive their rewards for remaining faithful to the Lamb. And all this is affirmed by the very Holy Spirit of God. This is one of only two places in the Revelation where the Spirit is quoted directly. The only other place is in chapter 22, verse 17, where it says, the Spirit and the bride say, come. But I want to go back for just a moment to verse 12 and look at it one more time. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Here we see a reference to a very important doctrine, which is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Not only is this one of the most important doctrines of the faith, it is also one of the most comforting. MacArthur explains it expresses the truth that all those whom God has elected, called, and justified will never lose their faith, but will persevere until death. They will persevere until the end. And the evidence of the eternal security of these saints is the same as it is in any age, including this one, that they will keep the commandments of God, they will persevere, and they will not waver in their faith in Jesus Christ. This is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Genuine saving faith always results in obedience to Christ, and it always perseveres until the end. And if someone falls away from the faith, it is simply evidence that there was no true spiritual regeneration to begin with. But these valiant believers during the tribulation will stay true to the Lord 
even if it means they have to die as martyrs, and many of them will. And many, of course, died as martyrs in the early days of the church, during the days of the Reformation. Today, even in our day and time, in some parts of the world, genuine believers are having to die for their faith. Well, in verses 14 through 20, we have the reaping of the ripe. The reaping of the ripe. These verses are a summary of the final judgment. And we know that the first time Jesus came to earth, he came as the suffering servant. But the next time, he will come as sovereign king. The first time he came, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. But the next time he comes, he will come to judge the living and the dead. In other words, the first time he came as the sower, the next time he will come as the reaper. And in this passage, we see the final day of the Lord judgment. The harvest is an Old Testament figure used for divine judgment. Jesus also likened the final judgment to the harvest of the earth in Matthew 13, verses 30 and 39. And this is the picture that we find in this passage of Scripture. And we read this earlier, but let's go through it. There are really two visions here instead of just one. Some people read this and think this is speaking of two ways of describing the same event. But these are really two different things. And we're going to see the harvest of the grain and the harvest of the grapes. So that's the outline. But we need to understand that the grain harvest is not the same thing as the grape harvest. The grain harvest symbolizes the seven bowl judgments. The grape harvest is the judgment of Armageddon. The first one applies to both believers and unbelievers. The second one is of a vintage and applies only to unbelievers, specifically those armies that have gathered themselves against Israel in the valley of Megiddo. You say, preacher, are you sure about that? I'm fairly certain, but let's look at it a little more carefully. We begin with the harvest of the grain, the harvest of the grain. The terminology used in verses 14 through 16 apply to the reaping of wheat. Notice the use of the word harvest in verse 15. And notice who it is who oversees this harvest. It is the Son of Man, verse 14. And even though there are some who want to say that this is an angel here, I believe there is no doubt it is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how Jesus referred to himself back in chapter 1 and verse 13, the Son of Man. And of course, that is how Jesus often referred to himself in the Gospels. In the Gospel of Matthew alone, he is referred to that way more than 25 times. And I have no doubt whatsoever that this is the Lord of the harvest, the second person of the Trinity, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, notice some details of this text. In verse 14, the white cloud symbolizes the glory and majesty of the Lord. That is taken from Daniel chapter 7. The reaper is sitting on the cloud, waiting for the proper time to stand and harvest the earth. The sharp sickle, which is used in both of these analogies, is likely a corollary to the sharp two-edged sword that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord in Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. In fact, in Revelation 19, 15, it's very clear. It says, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he might smite the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. The crown that is on his head is not the diadem of a king. It is the Stephanos of a victor. This is a victor's crown. 
This refers to the fact that he comes as one who has conquered sin, death, and Satan. And now, one who has conquered all the armies of men who follow after the beast. Once he has prevailed, he will wear the diadem, chapter 19, verse 12, as a sign of his royalty. And then notice that last phrase of verse 16, and the earth was reaped. The brevity of this statement dramatizes the suddenness of the judgment. After years of enduring Antichrist's oppressive rule, demonic assaults, and the terrifying, devastating, staccato judgments of God, people will wearily (coughs) hope that things are about to get better. And it will seem as if life couldn't possibly get any worse, but it does. The cataclysmic day of the Lord judgment is about to fall on Satan, his demon hordes, the Antichrist, and all the wicked, unrepentant people of the world. My friend, listen, you can count on it. Someday there is going to be a harvesting of the earth. It is going to take place just before Christ returns to this earth at the end of the tribulation. And this will mark the end of the age of grace. And the details of this judgment are given in chapter 16 as the bowls of wrath (coughs) are poured out on the earth. And those seven rapid fire bowl judgments will mark the final reaping of the earth. But there's a second picture that we see here, and that is the harvest of the grapes. The harvest of the grapes. In verses 17 through 20, we see the picture of the vintage. This imagery is even more dramatic because of the analogy of the wine press. The vineyard account goes further than that of the harvest account to picture the gruesome outcome of the judgment process. A vineyard in Scripture sometimes represents Israel, such as in Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 7. But in this context, it is clear that it represents the destruction of the armies of God. In this judgment, we see that it is carried out by Christ himself rather than the angels, even though verse 17 tells us that it is initiated by an angel. And another angel is pictured as carrying it out. When we get to chapter 19, we will see that it is the Lord himself who will appear on a white horse and destroy the armies of the Antichrist. MacArthur explains that while the angel cuts the grapes, it is the Lord Jesus who crushes out their lives. It is the Lord Jesus who crushes the grapes. And in this judgment, all the clusters of grapes that are gathered in the harvest are cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God. These are all unbelievers who are destined for destruction. And notice this judgment is specified not as eternal hell, but as something that occurs on earth. Trodden without the city refers to Jerusalem. This is a reference to the battle of Armageddon that we'll see in chapter 19, verses 17 to 19. Now, the grape harvest and the making of wine from grapes was a common event in the Middle East in the days in which John wrote this. The grapes would be cut from the vines, then they would be placed in a large stone vat, and the vine dressers would then trample the grapes with their feet, and the juice would splatter all over the place. But it would eventually run down a channel into another vat where the juice would be gathered for consumption. But in the case being described here in Revelation 14, it is not 
uh, grape juice, but it is blood that is being pictured. And it will not just be a small trickle, but enough to fill the valley of Megiddo to the height of a horse's bridle for 200 miles. Now here in verse 18, the word for ripe is a different Greek word. This word means fully grown or in prime condition. In other words, this is saying that the events of the tribulation will perfectly prepare the way for the nations of the world to gather together for this great slaughter. The timing will be perfect. And just when they have gathered together, thinking that they are going to wipe out the people of God, the Lord will come and trample the grapes. Now notice some other details here. The little phrase outside the city in verse 20 means, of course, outside Jerusalem. And the Bible makes it clear that the great armies of the world (coughs) will gather against Israel in the valley of Megiddo or Armageddon for one final conflict. Now think about it. At least 200 million soldiers from the Orient, along with millions from the forces of the West, headed by Antichrist and the revived Roman Empire. And you have the makings of the greatest battle in the history of the world. But what they won't realize as they gather for battle, they are actually stepping right into the winepress of the wrath of God. Isaiah 34 says, Their slain shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Now you can't paint a more horrible picture than that. You know, all the horror movies in the world put together can't touch this. Johnson writes, the final verse, verse 20, is gruesome. Blood flows up to the horse's bridles for a distance of about 200 miles, 1,600 stadia. The source of the imagery is Isaiah 63, 1 through 6. Heightened by John's hyperbole, the symbolism is that of a head-on battle, a great defeat of the enemy, a sea of spilled blood. Now, some have questioned the practicality of this and therefore have tended not to take it literally. But Hal Lindsey said, I measured from the point where the valley of Armageddon slopes down to the Jordan Valley and from the point southward down the valley through the Dead Sea to the port of Elath on the Gulf of Aqaba measures, all of that measures approximately 200 miles. The Bible tells us that the battlefield stretches from Megiddo on the north to Edom on the south, a distance of approximately 200 miles. It reaches from the Mediterranean Sea on the west to the hills of Moab on the east, which is a distance of about 100 miles. It includes the valleys of Jehoshaphat and the plains of Esdralon. And of course, the center of it all will be the city of Jerusalem. Napoleon called this area the world's greatest natural battlefield because of the ideal terrain for the world's armies to maneuver. But someday, it will become a great sea of blood with the stench of dead bodies filling the air. And by the way, even those who do not take this completely literally still see this as describing an exceedingly great slaughter. What a picture this is. The precious blood of the lamb having been rejected. The blood of the martyrs who refused the mark of the beast having been trampled underfoot will now make way for the blood of those who have defiled God 
and have followed Satan and his puppet, the Antichrist. It is a frightful picture indeed. As a ripe grape is smashed and the juice flies in every direction, so will little man fall into the vat of the wrath of God. This is Armageddon. This is the Mount of of Slaughter. This is the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, many other passages describe this same scene, but we don't have time tonight to see all those. What a day that will be. Let's pray together. Father, we pray tonight that you'll help us to really grasp this time in the future, that we would understand how sober the message is, how urgent the gospel is. So, Lord, help us. Help us to be bold. Help us to be uh, diligent, to be about your work with a renewed vigor that we would tell everyone we know around us, everyone we work with, all of our neighbors, our family members who don't know Christ, and warn them of the great day of judgment to come. And Lord, help us as we do that, that your Holy Spirit might quicken the truth of your word to their hearts and minds and illumine the message of the gospel that they might understand and believe and repent and receive salvation in Christ. Help us to be about that work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.